Hey, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Luke um, uh, for a little bit today. Um, and if you're, if you're new, we're actually starting a new series today. Uh, we've actually been uh, having a conversation around the book of Daniel for the last um, 12 weeks or so. But we're starting a new series today. And um, it's called Eating with Jesus. And kicking off this series, and it's actually a practice. And if you've been around our church uh, long enough to know, we, we actually love the word practice. Because we actually believe that to be, be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did actually takes us not just learning the Bible or learning about Jesus, but actually practicing the things that Jesus did, okay? And this practice all centers around the idea of eating. Who's a fan of that? Anybody in the room, right? So as we head towards Easter and beyond, we want to explore the life of Jesus, particularly the people he ate and drank with. And we want to take on that practice in our own lives. Now, for some of you who've been around the last number of weeks, we've been talking about this concept of a creative minority. And this all came from this idea that um, we are now moving into a post-Christian context, which means that um, we're in, a, in an age right now, we're in a, in a, in a season where it, everything is different. There's like, an, there's like a, a reaction against Christianity. And so we've been talking about what it looks like to be a minority in that context and to follow Jesus in that context and how it takes creativity to do that. And so last week we had a panel discussion up here. How awesome was that, by the way? Did you guys enjoy that? Yes. And so Cammie and Holly and Randy and Dan uh, were a part of that last week, and they were just honest and very thoughtful uh, about some of the things that they're wrestling with in their own life um, but take a listen to this quote. This is from somebody named Rosaria Butterfield, Butterfield, sorry. And she says this, let's face it. We have become unwelcome guests in this post-Christian world. Our children ride their scooters in neighborhoods where conservative Christianity is dismissed or denounced as irrelevant, irrational, discriminatory, and dangerous. Many of us go to work in places where sensitivity training has become an Orwellian nightmare. Christian common sense is declared hate speech by the newskeepers of this culture. The old rules don't apply anymore. Many Christians genuinely do not know what to say to their unbelieving neighbors. The language and the logic have changed almost overnight. So... We're still wrestling with what this means. And part of the reason why we're still talking about that, we're not switching gears, we're gonna to continue to talk about that, is because I believe this practice that we're about to learn from the life of Jesus is actually a really powerful uh, uh, tool for us to be in, in the lives of people in our world. So how do we invite people to follow Jesus along with, along with us in a time like this? right? How does that work? How do we introduce the reality of the kingdom of God, of life and life to the full, to people in our lives? How do we do that? And because here's the, recognize that the spirit has put a love in our hearts for people in our lives, people we work with, people we work out with, uh, our baristas, our, our neighbors, and, and, and God has put this love in our hearts for them. And how do we invite people into what is so important to us? And that is apprenticing Jesus and seeing life and life to the full. How do we do that? Well, option one is that we don't, that we don't say anything, that in the public square, or in our lives, we just hole up and, and our homes become castles where we, we go inside and, and lock out everything around us. Option two is that we, we just edit the way of Jesus. We make the way of Jesus a little bit more PC. We make the way of Jesus uh, fit. We, we take the hard stuff out and we keep all the, the really, you know, the coffee cup phrases, you know, of Jesus. Um, third option is this. We adopt a practice. 
that actually when you look back in the, in the history of the church has transcended all the way through. And we're gonna take a look at Luke chapter 19 and we're gonna figure out what that is. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. He, he was a, a wee little man was he. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Actually, I, I, really quickly, you just need to understand, some scholars believe that the he was short part was actually referring to Jesus. So, blow your mind. Jesus could have been short. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Basically, you're rich, I'm homeless, do the math. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son son of Abraham, for the son of man, you remember that phrase from Daniel? The son of man came to seek and save the lost. So here's the thing. It's easy to read this story in a very, you know, cute, sentimental Sunday school way. Like it, it's, a, it's a neat story. There's a song to it. Um, Jesus loves short people. Um, Jesus might be a short person. But to the original audience, this interaction was offensive. It was deeply offensive. It was actually so confusing and dangerous. There was whispering. There was talk back. There was, there was you know, people talking behind Jesus' back. It was disruptive. And there's two reasons behind this. And some of you know a little bit of this background, but... Uh, a tax collector um, who scholars like to call tax collectors tax farmers. Uh, so think of it as a, it, we'll get into it here in a second. And then, and then some of the other people that Jesus was accused of hanging out with were who? Sinners and prostitutes. So tax farmers and prostitutes were Jesus's uh, hanging, he was hanging out with them all the time. And so when we talk about tax farmers, these were not Romans, these were Jews. And they were Jews who, on top of the normal Roman tax, which many scholars believe was 50%, were actually charging an extra percentage on top of that. So you're Peter, and you're cruising on down the road, and you're passing into Jerusalem, you're passing into another district, a tax collector could take not only what the government, the Roman government wanted from you, but actually exercise an extra tax. And if you complained or ridiculed them or whatever, they're just going, okay, 10% more. And, and for some of you who have seen this, um, it's interesting. I, I don't want to badger TSA workers but there's an interesting set of power that TSA workers have. And so if you haven't heard the stories, if you mouth off to a TSA worker, they have the power of whether you fly not only that day, but that year in their hands, okay? So I'm not badgering them. I'm just saying they have a lot of power. So don't mouth off at a TSA worker. And don't be like, oh, I got a bomb in my bag. Don't do that either, okay? That, Idiots do that. But here's the thing, like the, the, the tax farmers, the Jewish tax farmers were hated by their own people, hated because they were notoriously corrupt. Uh, 
And if you didn't pay them, they actually had the backing of the Roman garrison to make sure you paid. So they could snap their fingers, Roman guard would come over, make sure that you paid. Then there was the prostitutes. Now, we, we don't, uh, our day and age, we're so, our society is so sex-saturated, this, this doesn't seem as scandalous as it was for them. And, and every society has rungs uh, on the moral ladder, and every society has bottom rungs on the moral ladder. So we think, man, Jesus, he's so, so crazy, he's so punk rock. He, was, he, he hung out with tax collectors, and, and we think, oh, we don't have tax collectors anymore. We have IRS agents, and that's not the same thing. And, um, and so it's all, we try to transpose it into our culture. But Jesus eating with tax farmers and prostitutes was similar to Jesus in our day and age eating with human traffickers, pedophiles, white supremacists that march at Charlottesville, and maybe sitting around the campfire in a cave with an ISIS terrorist. And think about what that would do to you if you saw that. Think about the effect that would have on you. Think about how confusing that would be for you if this rabbi hung out with people like that. Think about what that would do. The second thing that's interesting is, you know, there's the different levels on on the rungs of culture, but the second thing that's important to understand about this culture is they had a culture of table fellowship. And, and for the first century Jews, meals were a boundary marker about what people, what brought people together and what kept people apart, okay? So think of, in, in, in our context or in our history, think of pre-civil rights, the South, and restaurants, and segregation, or in Europe where there would be signs in, uh, especially in in England, there would be signs in cafes that say, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Think about that kind of separate fellowship. And even today, most of us eat with people that are like us. Let's just be honest, okay? If we're really honest, in the last month, if you were to make a list of the people that you meal with, you were either related to them looked pretty similar to them, or were we actually in the same somewhat general economic um, strata as them? My words are not coming very clear today. And so true of all societies, but especially with first century Jews, table fellowship was super important. Now, I'm going to nerd out a little bit. We're going to go back because you remember the, the whole idea of exile. And, and we've talked about this the last number of weeks. The, the people of Israel are thrown into exile. They're ripped away from Jerusalem. They're in Babylon. They actually have to think creatively about how to uh, uh, follow God, follow Yahweh, worship Yahweh in a context that is foreign to them. And so the rabbis at the time got creative and they reinvented what it looked like to worship Yahweh and to follow the law. So if you were to read Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it's really tough to do those things and to practice those bits of the worship in Judaism if you don't have a temple, okay? You can't perform sacrifices and you can't do all the normal priestly things. And so what they did was the rabbis kind of reinvented a new thing. The home was the new temple, The home became the new temple. The table became the new altar. The dad, the father of the house, became the new priest. And the meal was the new sacrifice. And so as you gathered together, it was very powerful, very spiritual. And it sounds really cool, doesn't it? But then the Pharisees come along. And remember, the Pharisees weren't always off track, Okay? The Pharisees were from the line of Ezra, 
And they uh, began to reinstill, once we came back from exile, once the people came back from ex exile, the Pharisees started out really good, but along the way, they lost the plot line. Okay, they lost the meaning of what was happening. Their thinking was, what got us into exile, okay, was sin as a nation. And if you read Daniel's prayer, Daniel's prayer is confessing the sin of himself and the nation. So their thinking was what would get us out of exile would be less sin, following the law. Now you need to understand, fast forward, the people of Israel are in uh, Jerusalem, but they are oppressed by the Romans. And, and at this time, there's only about a third of the people who uh, follow Yahweh, call themselves Jews, that are actually in the land. The two-thirds of them are still scattered all throughout um, the Middle East. And the thinking of the Pharisees at the time of Jesus was this. If all of Israel would keep the Torah for 24 hours, just 24 hours, if we all just were really, really good and really faithful for 24 hours, come on, everybody, we can unlock Messiah and Messiah would come back and, and, and free us from this oppression and we would be our own people again. And so the Pharisees upped the ante. In fact, the idea behind this was, let's shoot for every person, every male, female, everybody, shooting for the holiness of the priesthood. Like, let's, let's aim high. Let's up the ante. The goal was holiness, and that was really important to them. And so think about this. So living a life set at the bar for a priest, a priest who worked in the temple, demands, it means, that no Gentile was ever allowed in your house, let alone at your table. Does that make sense? No Gentile. In fact, not only no Gentile, but anybody with a deformity, every, anybody with a, a disorder, anybody that was unclean, anybody that was not Torah observant, a tax farmer, a prostitute, for sure. See, if you were a rabbi in that culture, you would never be caught dead with Zacchaeus. And this is what makes this story so amazing, so scandalous. Listen to this quote. This is a guy named Scott Barchi. He said this, it would be difficult to overestimate the importance of table fellowship for the cultures of the Mediterranean basin in the first century of our era. Mealtimes were far more than occasions for individuals to consume nourishment. Being welcome at a table for the purpose of eating food with another person had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. Thus, betrayal or unfaithfulness towards anyone with whom one shared uh, the table was viewed as particularly reprehensible. On the other hand, when persons were estranged, a meal invitation opened the way to reconciliation, right? Isn't that beautiful? And this is a German theologian. Listen to this. In the East, even today, to invite a person to a meal was an offer of peace, trust, brotherhood or sisterhood, and forgiveness. Sharing a table meant sharing life. In Judaism in particular, table fellowship means fellowship before God, for the eating of a piece of broken bread by everyone who shares in a meal brings out the fact that they all have a share in the blessings uh, of the blessing which the master of the house had spoken over the unspoken bread. The inclusion of sinners in the community of salvation achieved in table fellowship is the most, listen to this, meaningful expression of the message of the redeeming love of God. Eating a meal with somebody was so powerful. Now, as we march closer to Good Friday and to Easter, you need to understand something. Jesus got himself killed precisely because of the people he ate with. Precisely because of the people he ate with. 
And for Rabbi Jesus, a meal was not supposed to be a way of keeping people out, but inviting people in. And so, and, and hear this, when, when, we, when we read uh, that line, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, when Jesus says that, um, this, this idea of the Son of Man coming to seek and save the lost, the Son of Man was something when you, well, we talked about this a few weeks back, I'm going to go through all of it, but it's this picture of Messiah, and this is an oral culture. So when you heard this story being told and you heard, for the Son of Man came, okay, for the Son of Man came, uh, you remember that phrase. That phrase would stick into your mind. Not only was it a powerful phrase from the book of Daniel, but, well, let's fast forward to Luke chapter 7. Look at this. Where did it go? There it is. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he has a demon. So Jesus is responding to some Pharisees. Verse 34, the son of man came eating and drinking. And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And I love this. This is like one of my favorite lines of Jesus. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Love that. But when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life, we believe this was a prostitute, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. So imagine the courage. There's probably a lot of people there. She probably was able to kind of sneak her way in. She heard Jesus was there. And she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. Now, as a woman in that culture, you were not to let your hair down for any reason in public, ever. And it says, and she kissed and poured perfume on them. Um, some scholars actually believe that this was the only way that she knew how to interact with a man. Verse 39, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, okay, he says to himself, self, if this man were a prophet, so he's talking to himself in his head, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Jesus answered him. I love that. Like he's saying this in his head and then Jesus is like, I know what you're thinking. I got a story for you. I have something to tell you, Simon. He's like, tell me. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him, owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. So think of a day's wages. A denarii is a day's wages. So think two years of income versus two to three months of income. Uh, neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had a bigger debt forgiven. Jesus says, you have judged correctly. And this is just a form of irony. This is just the way they talked. And, and we actually, some scholars believe there's actually, this is part of a humorous conversation that Jesus is actually evoking some humor here, much like we do sarcasm. Does anybody like sarcasm? Right? So this is kind of like one of those kind of plays um, back and forth. It's kind of humorous. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Now, just that act, do you see this woman? The Pharisee had to acknowledge her existence. Jesus forced him to look at her, to acknowledge her humanity, to acknowledge her humanness standing right there. He says, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. So a sandals culture, hot, arid climate. What you would do is if you had guests over, you would actually offer people water to clean up their feet. Their feet were all grimy, nasty. You know, uh, you got kids. You know what's going on. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. Uh, welcoming guests, you would kiss on the cheeks. And it was a sign of, of brotherhood and, and equal peer relationship. She comes in kissing Jesus' feet. She does not feel worthy. It's powerful. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume 
on my feet. Another sign of welcome. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So this is, this is interesting. This is like a rule in Jesus' life, not the exception. This idea of table fellowship. And r- what really is happening here is there's a, there's a meal and she is obviously not invited, but she courageously barges in. Jesus has, has welcomed her. In Luke, 50 references to Jesus in eating and drinking. 50. In Matthew, 94. Some of the, some of the references to Jesus and, and equating Jesus with food or, or, or having Jesus involved with food starts in the birth narrative. G, uh, in Luke chapter 2, uh, Jesus is born in the feeding trough, which is this idea of, of Jesus being food for the world, like this idea of Jesus being an offering for the world. Luke 5, dinner at Levi's house. Luke 7, dinner at Simon the Pharisee's house. We just read. Luke 9, feeding of the 5,000. Luke 10, Mary and Martha. Luke 11, dinner with Pharisees again, right? Uh, Luke 14, when you throw a party, invite the poor. Jesus' conversation with people. Luke 15, the prodigal son, or is it sons, okay? Luke 16, parable of the rich and Lazarus. Luke 19, dinner at Zacchaeus' house. Luke 22, the last supper we're going to talk about in a few weeks. And then Luke 34, the road to Emmaus, Jesus has dinner with these two disciples who are so brokenhearted that the Messiah has been killed. And as he breaks bread and opens up his hands, they are like, oh, we get it now. See, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. I mean, if you read it, if you really take a look at it, I like this Jesus, right? Like, be become do, right? I'm always going to a meal, coming for a meal, or at a meal. So here's the thing. Uh, there's a couple books that we're reading kind of alongside of this, and you're welcome to join us. Um, uh, our small group's reading a, a book by a guy named Tim Chester. It's called A Meal with Jesus. And the other one I'll tell you about here in a second. But Tim Chester comes up with a verbal formula, Okay, and you remember the son of man part, the son of man came. Uh, The first part we read was the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Okay, and if you were a first century Jew and you heard that phrase, you were like, oh yeah, okay, that's clear. I know know what that means. And and we believe that's Jesus's mission. Jesus's mission is to, to, he's the son of man coming to seek and save the lost. That is his mission on earth. Luke 7 tells us his method. The son of man came eating and drinking. So what we've, uh, Tim, Tim Chester's kind of come up with this idea that Jesus lived in a culture that was actually hostile to his way of life, hostile to the kingdom of God. So how did Jesus invite people into the kingdom? One meal at a time. One meal at a time. That was his method of evangelism. Now, when you hear the word evangelism, if you're like me, that kind of gives you the... We talked about that a few weeks ago. I have a love-hate relationship with the word evangelism. Um, it's very, it, there's a lot of Christian culture stuff going on. In it. You know me, I'm not a big fan of Christian culture. Sometimes for some of us, it feels like network marketing, right? Like a bait and switch. Like, um, hey, um, you know, let's be friends, but I, only because I want to tell you about Jesus. Um, or you go to someone's house for dinner, and then like 20 minutes later, you get a pamphlet. You know, it's like network marketing. You say, hey, you could work from home just like me. And you're just like, oh, that's what this is about. Um, it's just such a bummer. Uh, I've been riding around in, in um, uh, uh, cop cars with uh, police officers, getting to know them uh, as a chaplain. 13 years ago, there was a chaplaincy program in Arvada, and there was a couple um, goofy chaplain characters that they would get into the car with an officer and immediately they'd be like, hey, if you were to get shot tonight, do you know where you'd go? So the officers were like, you know what? I'd rather not have the chaplain ride around with me 
<laughs> so, um, but Jesus was constantly sharing and helping people imagine a different kingdom, a different way of life, and offering it to anybody um, that he came into contact with. Because the kingdom of God is near, he would say, kingdom of God is near, and all you have to do is unlock the deepest place in your life, the deepest part of yourself, your heart, to this new reality, right? And, and experience forgiveness, and, and apprentice me, and follow me, and I will show you life and life to the full. And if Jesus had a method of evangelism, it was eating and drinking with people. Now, he did preach, right? And usually it was people who were kind of connected to him, really. Uh, Jewish people or people who had thought a certain way. And so Sermon on the Mount and, and, and the you have heard it said, but I tell you this. Um, he would stand up and actually preach. But what would it look like for Jesus to invite people to follow him who lived on the margins? Well, it would be Meals. It tended to be opening, opening uh, conversation around a meal, a long meal. And I think that's for some of us. The, the reality is for some of us, what would it look like to open our homes and eat a long meal and spend time with people that no upstanding religious leader would spend time with? What would that look like? And you sit around, you could talk about the meaning of life, you could ask questions, you could hear their story, um, you could listen, you could hear their fears and their ideas and listen. And if the time opens up, share what you are working through in your apprenticeship to Jesus. What would that look like? The New Testament writers call this hospitality. Um, just get nerdy on some language here. The word stranger in Greek is, is xenos. It's where we get the word xenophobia, which has been thrown around quite a bit in our culture lately. Uh, the Greek word for hospitality is philoxenia. And here's a good uh, definition of hospitality. Expressing the welcome of God the Father to all through tangible acts of love, ideally through the giving of food, shelter, and relationship. Now, hospitality is sometimes hard to define because it really, first and foremost, it's a posture of our hearts. It's like an actual, it, it actually leaks out in very tangible acts of love. And all throughout the New Testament, followers of Jesus are actually commanded to practice hospitality, to practice philoxenia. Listen to this, Romans 12, 13. Share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Uh, this, this word is actually diacontes, which actually means be eager to practice hospitality. Be eager to practice it. 1 Peter 4, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multi over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Check out Hebrews 13. Keep on loving one another. As brothers and sisters, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without even knowing it. First Timothy and Titus talk about leaders and elders in the church and how they need to be hospitable. They need to be people who practice hospitality. You never hear of a pastor being fired because they haven't had people into their house for dinner. You do hear them being fired because they're like heretics or they had an affair or whatever, but you rarely hear pastors like not, well, they don't have people over anytime, ever. I actually know a pastor uh, that, that he moved to a new city um, and he purposely lived 45 minutes away from the church so that people, he wouldn't have to run into them even at the grocery store. You know, I actually know a pastor that actually saw people at a grocery store and hid. That's pretty interesting, right? But never once you hear a story about like an elder being let go because they're not hospitable. If you apprentice Jesus, 
And what I'm telling you today is, if you apprentice Jesus, you are commanded to carry on the practice of hospitality. And it's very ordinary, and it's very life-changing. There is another book that we are walking through, and you're welcome to pick it up. It's called The Gospel Comes with a House Key by Rosaria Butterfield. And Rosaria Butterfield's story is actually very amazing. It's, uh, her bio is, is pretty amazing. She was um, a professor at Syracuse University. She was far left, radical, lesbian feminist professor at Syracuse University. Her PhD was in postmodern critical thinking and literature. Um, she was writing a book about how Bible-believing Christians are the worst people on the planet. And she wrote an op-ed in a New York um, a newspaper about a men's conference that had been on the East Coast. I don't know if it was Promise Keepers or whatever. I don't know what it was. But she wrote like this blistering, scathing op-ed about it. And a pastor from that part of the uh, country actually wrote a very thoughtful, very gracious uh, response to her um, and invited her to his house for dinner. And so she thought, well, I don't know any of these weirdos that I'm writing a book about, so might as well do some research. So she goes to this guy's house and she tells the story about driving into his driveway and being welcomed into their home with such gracious, wonderful hospitality. And they sat around a meal for hours and talked. And what one meal turned into another meal, which turned into another meal and another, and then they invited them over for a Bible study and invited her over for this. And she, fast forward a number of years, she's married to a, um, a Presbyterian pastor. And um, she is... Uh, it's just a crazy story. She, a Reformed Presbyterian pastor, their foster parents, and their home is actually uh, opened up. They actually run kind of a Christian commune out of their house. And she is a phenomenal writer, and you will love, love, love reading her. And so her message is this to the church. The LGBTQ community is actually does a way better job at at hospitality than the church does, even though the church has the biggest tradition of it, going all the way back to the early church. And she writes this in her book. She says, Rad radically ordinary hospitality, which I think I'll steal that uh, for the title of the sermon. Those who live, those who live it, see strangers as neighbors and neighbors as family of God. They recoil at reducing a person to a category or a label. They see God's image reflected in the eyes of every human being on earth. Those who live out radical, ordinary hospitality see their homes not as their, not as their own, not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. They open doors. They seek out the underprivileged. They know that the gospel comes with a house key. I love it. There's an Australian chef turned theologian named Simon Carey Holt, and he says this. You guys sick of the quotes yet? Good. It's good to be reminded, other people say things better than me. Um, it's good to be reminded that the table is a very ordinary place, a place so routine and everyday that it's easily overlooked as a place of ministry. At its base, hospitality is about providing a place, a space for God's spirit to move. Setting a table, cooking a meal, washing the dishes is the ministry of facilitation. Providing a context in which people feel loved and welcomed and where God's spirit can be at work in their lives. Hospitality is a very ordinary business. But its ordinariness is its real worth. Whatever it looks like, your own table is a sacred place. Now, it just so happens that the gospel pairs really nicely with like a fresh loaf of bread or a, a big pot of soup or whatever you like to do. Now, some of you are in the room, you're like, you're already writing me off. You're like, I'm too busy. 
Uh, my neighbors are weirdos. I can't cook. I'm an introvert. You can only get off the hook so much, introverts. Hospitality, what I'm telling you today, hospitality is not the same as entertainment. So some of you watch these Food Network shows and you're like, oh, geez, I've got to like Pinterest this meal, you know, so people will, I got to get all this crap at Hobby Lobby and throw it out. <laughs> Listen, that's not what I'm saying. You don't have to take a picture of this beautiful table setting. It doesn't have to be anything like it. It's not Martha Stewart at 10,000 square foot home before you can actually invite people in. I'm not talking about entertaining people. Okay? I'm not talking about entertainment. Entertainment is about status. Entertainment is about performance. Entertainment is about recipro reciprocity. <laughs> I did go to college. And it's about like, okay, I hosted you, now you can host me. That's not what this is about. Hospitality is about generosity. It's about inclusion, and it's about serving people. Luke, uh, Luke 14, this is the last bit, bit of scripture. It says, then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends your brothers or sisters, your relatives, your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back. That's that word I stumbled with. And so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although you they can't repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The poor, the lame, the crippled, the blind, they were the people that could not fulfill Torah. They were the people that were holding the Jews back from experiencing all God had planned for them according to the Pharisees. So last week during our creative minority paddle, we had just a lot of honesty around here. We talked about how do we counter hyper-individualism in our culture? Uh, what does it look like for us to counter that in our culture? Well, this is a great practice. This is going to stretch us. I have a dear friend of mine. His name is Tim Andrews. I've told the story to you uh, before. Uh, he's just got a, quite a journey in his life. Um, he is uh, disabled. He actually had his leg amputated because of an infection because he is, um, he's got, um, what do you call it? Hemophilia, that's what it is. Um, and, and his joints always ache and he's got some deformities and he's had this really a horrible journey in the life, in his young life through the church. Um, and him and I have gotten to be really good friends. And we talk a lot of baseball. We talk a lot of football. We talk a lot of economics and cultural issues. And because I'm his friend and every two weeks I drive all the way up to his house in Thornton with a breakfast burrito because he loves them and we sit and we talk and his dogs just lick me up and down and, and it's just like our time, Tim and I. And sometimes it's just sports and sometimes he just unloads on me the pain he's in and the depression he's going through. Sometimes... He asks me about Jesus. Last fall, we were talking about the resurrection. And I got to talk to him about that. And I said, Tim, Scripture says that one day, the resurrection is for all of us. And one day, that you will be able to stand up again and walk and you won't have pain. And I just walked him through all this stuff because all he heard in his life was be good or God's gonna zap you. All he heard was he doesn't fit in and he's, he, people don't wanna touch him because 
He has, uh, hemo- they're afraid of breaking him. And he actually got HIV from a blood transfusion. And during the 80s, all of his Christian friends were afraid that they were going to catch it. So they never hung out with him again. Jesus came eating and drinking. And Jesus had a method of sharing the kingdom with people. And that was eating and drinking with them. People far from God. And all through the New Testament, apprentices of Jesus are actually commanded to follow this example of practicing hospitality with people that you probably shouldn't practice hospitality with. That you weren't called to practice hospitality. Something as radical and as ordinary as setting a table, making a meal, and inviting people to it. What if we were to recapture that? Like, What if that became something we worked toward? Radically ordinary hospitality as a way of life for us. And where can you start? Some of you are like, listen, I live with roommates and they're messy and, and I'm poor. Listen, do what Jesus did. He was homeless. He invited himself over to people's houses. <laughs> like, do that. Like, hey, listen, I'm a college student, but I'd love to have a meal cooked by you. <laughs> right? Try it. Jesus did it. Some of you... You haven't had anybody over to eat at your home in forever. Not even friends. And and maybe you just need to start with people you know and and invite people to your home. Unlock your front door. All of us can do this. All of us can. You might say to yourself, I live live in in my base, in a basement, at my parents' house. You know, that's okay. Um, Invite people to a meal outside of your home. Um, Some of you are introverts and you're like, man, I'm an introvert. You can do it. You can do it. You are not the Unabomber, okay? You can do it. You're, some of you are like, I have little kids and they, they need an, an exorcism half the time. I don't want people to see that. <laughs> no, bring them into your mess. Let them know you're not perfect. Some of you are like, I, I don't know how to cook. YouTube it, look up a recipe and like practice it. Practice it the week before, tweak it. If you know someone with a good recipe, like, hey, will you help me? Will you teach me how to make that? Because that was really good. And if I could make that, people would actually come over to my house. (laughs) Like try it. What? DoorDash. DoorDash, (laughs) there you go. Jesus would have DoorDashed. Jesus would have had Zacchaeus DoorDash. <laughs> what I'm telling you is this. There's something beautiful about inviting people into your home. People, and, and, and some of you, it may need to start with people you know, people in your neighborhood, all that kind of stuff. And that's great. But for some of you, it may need to go further than that. There may be some people that you need to partner with that like you really wouldn't be, like some of your Christian friends would be like, really? You're having them over? Yeah, I want to hear their story. I want them to know that we're not that different. Like what would that look like if a community of people started doing that? I think it would be awesome. I think it would change the world. So let me pray.